In this webinar, we'll highlight the importance of librarians and archivists working together to accomplish goals. Attendees will learn basic archival policies, procedures, and the records life cycle, a management model for North American archivists since the 1960s. Hello, everyone. My name is Bethany Fichter, and I am the Rare Books and Manuscripts Supervisor at the Indiana State Library. I received my Master of Library Science degree from Indiana University Bloomington, specializing in archives and records management. I've been working at the library for a little over four years, providing leadership and direction for all activities within the Rare Books and Manuscripts Division. My interests include personnel and project management, exhibition design, and oral histories. Previous to this position, I worked within the Ball State University Archives and Special Collections as the Archivist for Manuscript and Digital Collections. My career beginnings were at Indiana University Bloomington as a photograph collection processing assistant um, and a digitization scanning technician within the digital library program. So I still consider myself a newbie, but it's becoming a realization that I've been a mentor for um, several years now. I take pride in training staff, graduate assistants, interns, and volunteers, and seeing them blossom into the library and archive world, most of the time without even realizing that's what they wanted to do in the first place. Now, before I dive in, I want to take time out and give you some information about the Indiana State Library, specifically um, the Rare Books and Manuscripts Division. We are very fortunate um, to have this wonderful collection, and it belongs to every citizen of the state of Indiana. In fact, our collection has been built with generous donations from our patrons for over 190 years. Now, the original intention of the library was to be used for legislators and state officials. We continue to develop and provide library services to state government, its branches, departments, and its officials and employees. But we also provide services for everyone within our state. We support the development of the library profession, kind of like this webinar, and we try to strengthen services to public and private libraries throughout the state. The Rare Books and Manuscripts Division includes over 3 million manuscripts, a little over 4,500 collections, ranging from the early 15th century to present day. If you're interested in learning more about Indiana's rich history, you might want to check out some of our favorites, including the Oliver P. Morton collection of correspondence, speeches, and photographs regarding Indiana politics in the Civil War, the original Treaty of St. Mary's, or family papers and account ledgers from our very own French fur trader, Hyacinth LaSalle, um, during the Northwest Territory. We also have several non-Indiana related gems, including our cuneiform tablet collection, dating from around 2350 BC, and a volume set of the American woods exhibited by actual specimens, um, where each volume includes at least 75 wood samples mounted in around 25 plates. We have an eclectic collection, and I like to tell everyone we can find you anything, probably more than what you were originally researching. And to give you a little background, I decided the creation of this webinar was long overdue after reading Archives and Libraries, What Librarians and Archivists Need to Know to Work Together by Jeanette A. Bastian, Megan Sniffen Marinoff, and Donna Weber. It's kind of like the authors read my mind. Um, during the development of this book, I was in the midst of accepting my current position with um, the understanding that I was a university um, archivist entering a special collection librarian world. Um, I'll admit, you know, at times it was a little daunting. Um, sometimes I found it incredibly difficult to communicate my thoughts. Um, and I really wish that I had this wonderful book back then. In 2013 um, to 2014, we were faced with a stressful task of relocating the rare books and manuscripts division in the library as part of future bicentennial plans. Within a matter of months, um, Changer became my moniker 
during the good, bad, and sometimes ugly conversations about workplace change. As the only formally trained archivist at the library, now heading a special archival collection, I quickly found it imperative that we all understand what archivists do and how they can work together to accomplish goals. I was definitely the outcast um, during the transition. Um, we all saw the puzzle pieces. Um, we knew that they needed to fit together. Um, and we tried our best um, to go through with staff to place puzzle pieces together in a quick and efficient manner. At the end of the day, um, we solved the puzzle. And with that, I'll be guiding you with items that came up along our journey. Now, I, I want to point out, before we move further, that archives and records management and special collection librarianship are actually add-on specializations to the existing MLS, MLIS program. Archival students are required to receive an additional 18 credit hours on top of the already MLS requirement, a total of 36 credit hours. Um, if you haven't received this specialization or have been certified by the academy, um, you've probably been formally trained by an archivist or maybe have asked many, many questions throughout your career at conferences, over lunch, or at institutional tours. Now, I believe everyone can benefit from a better understanding of what an archive does and how it can fit in with the institution's overall mention, mission. Um, in the last few years at the State Library, the Rare Books and Manuscripts Division has been experienced quite a renaissance with new staff and a larger budget for collection development, professional development supplies, and digitization. And I, I believe this attention is definitely due to the understanding of how an archive can positively impact the institution, its patrons, and staff. You know, archives are often seen as treasure troves or the gem of a collection. Beyond that, though, archives are important because they are powerful. They tell stories. And an archivist's responsibility is to preserve and make accessible history and culture. Uh, a pioneer of the archival field, Mark Green, stated, um, quote, we make accessible for use the primary sources of history. Our collections are first, most important, chief, key, principal, major, crucial, all synonyms for primary. We are alive with possibilities open to multiple interpretations and multiple uses, end quote. Now, during ACRL in March 2017, Carla Hayden, the 14th Librarian of Congress, spent over 15 minutes discussing the treasures of the Library of Congress, mainly archival documents curated by her staff. She described the experience of having access to these items as, quote, pinch me moments, end quote, or history coming alive. For almost a year, Hayden has made this part of her platform wherever she goes. It's part of her elevator speech, and it's catching on like wildfire fire throughout the country. Excuse me. I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but... David Ferriero, our 10th Archivist of the United States, is actually the first librarian to hold this coveted archivist position. During his tenure, Ferriero has committed to open government, transparency, and collaboration. What do all of these goals have in common? Preservation and access. Once again, the main responsibilities of the archivist. In 2012, Ferriero mentioned to Harvard Gazette, Quote, one of the core challenges facing today's librarians, archivists, and museum curators is the need for them to work across disciplines to deliver the integrated, seamless level of service that tech-savvy users are increasingly coming to expect. He later mentioned, we are all in the same business protecting, collecting, and allowing the use of information, end quote. So now, more than ever, our professions are battling relevancy, our collections are nothing without the staff behind them, and it's absolutely necessary we converge to gain a deeper understanding of our professions and how their responsibilities fit in with the overall mission of the institution. Switching gears, uh, did you know archives are relatively new in comparison to libraries? 
The Library of Congress is the largest library in the world and was formed by an act of Congress in 1800. In fact, the American Library Association is the oldest and largest association in the world. It was founded on October 6, 1876 during the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. Congress established the National Archives in, in 1934. The Society of American Archivists was founded in 1936, and it's North America's oldest and largest national professional association dedicated to the needs and interests of archives and archivists. The organization represents over 6,200 archivists employed by governments, universities, businesses, libraries, and historical organizations. Significantly, though, um, to place the history of the archival profession um, and library profession in perspective, the American Library Association existed 60 years prior to the Society of American Archivists, and the Library of Congress was created 134 years before the National Archives. So I'm, I'm going to begin by discussing basic archival policies and procedures, including the mission statement, collection development policy, deed of gift or donor form, uh, and reading room procedures. I'll then jump into the records life cycle based on the management model for North American archivists since the 1960s. And the life cycle mentioned today will cover paper-based collections in a special collection environment including acquisition, surveying, processing, arrangement and description, finding aid creation, online access, digitization, and possible disposition. Moving along, your institution probably has a mission statement or a statement guide, guiding policies and procedures. But what I want to know, does it mention anything about your archive or special collection um, and perhaps the relation it has to your overall institution? Do the goals of the overall institution include the following? That we will acquire, preserve, and provide access to rare and unique resources. You identify, collect, preserve materials that have some type of enduring historical value. Do you make materials accessible um, and promote their use? Are there any regulations regarding those uses? Please remember uh, that policies are not permanent. They really are ever-changing, especially with a new administration, staff, or even user base. Revisit your mission statement and ask if it should include archival terminology, such as access, which is locating relevant information through the use of indexes or finding aids, locating and retrieving information for use within legally established restrictions of privacy and confidentiality, archives, a place that preserves historical materials or materials created and received by a person, family, or organization. It might be synonymous with records, collection, a group of materials with some unifying characteristic or a single provenance. Preservation, material protection from deterioration, minimizing damage or loss of information. And since we're talking about archival terminology, you might consider picking up a copy of A Glossary of Archival and Records Terminology by Richard Pierce Moses, which is part of the Archival Fundamental series. There are three main areas I'd like to focus on when talking about collection development policies. Now, these items were taken from the Rare Books and Manuscripts Collection Development Policy, a framework that will be added to the overall State Library's Collection Development Policy once it's revised. And the first item is clientele served by the collection. Now, the policy of rare books and manuscripts is, of course, to provide access to and preserve materials for patrons, and that's subject to the appropriate care and handling of materials by the researcher. Patrons include legislators, state agency employees, independent researchers, faculty, students, and, of course, the general public. Individuals under the age of 18, their use um, must be accompanied by a parent or a guardian, and 
we select materials ahead of time in advance for them. The second item, priorities and limitations of the collection. We actively collect material related to Indiana's people, places, and events. And I encourage you to um, make a priority of your own um, if that's the case within your in own institution. So collections reflecting aspects of Indiana life are most heavily sought in our case. Um, but we also make sure to let our patrons know that we do not collect material focusing on non-Hoosier events, um, except those dealing primarily with a Hoosier's experience in lieu of such an event. Um, we also try not to accept material from a collection found in other repositories. And we also have a rule of thumb, a general rule of thumb, that anything over 10 cubic feet requires the approval of a, a, a supervisor. Strength and weaknesses, um, you know, it's always important to include a section with information about your collection strengths and weaknesses. For us, it's providing um, this information um, to patrons and it being a positive experience all around. Um, currently, our collection lacks resources in regard to business and industry. Um, and making sure administration, staff, and the general public are on the same page is, is really a must, and it has been positive. Subject areas and formats. Um, does your library have a subject area and format section within the collection development policy for archival materials? Those can include, but not limit, um, subject areas like agriculture, uh, church history, education, families, politics, women, etc. And from there, in formats such as correspondence, diaries, engravings, postcards, photographs, and etc. If not, um, I suggest revisiting, um, but do consider any archival supplies needed to take on such a task, of course. Now, the deed of gift or donor form is a formal and legal agreement between the donor of a collection and the repository. The deed of gift is the most critical document because it defines future access and use. Now, rare books and manuscripts encourages donations adhering to the existing collection development policy. Donations or gifted items are accepted um, upon a supervisor's approval. If the supervisor is in absence, an acting representative, such as the state librarian, an associate director, or another supervisor can approve or decline a donation or gift. On occasion, a librarian one um, can also accept a donation with the prior approval of a supervisor. In the circumstance that a donation is brought on site without prior approval, a supervisor and a conservator um, is notified immediately. Now, I'd like to take time out and provide you with a donation story that happened to us a few years ago before formal procedures were in place. Um, a donation was accepted and brought into the reading room by a donor. They signed the deed of gift and they were extremely happy because someone was willing to take the collection that was left in a barn for decades. So after the conservator and I began to survey the documents, we realized there was a major problem because it was the worst mold we had ever discovered during our careers. And we had to immediately close down the reading room and began uh, a plan of attack. So the next morning, we had to make sure the room was clean from top to bottom, and a majority of the collection was disposed of, um, and we are still working through the items that were salvageable. So I, I can't stress enough the importance of a procedure or workflow in place for donations, because you never know what you might receive, including mold and pests. Um, we now have a space in our library dedicated for receiving materials for these specific reasons. Um, if you'd like more information about mold, um, you can earn LEUs by viewing a recorded webinar provided by uh, Connecting to Collections Care. And I have added that link into a supplemental packet that will be uploaded with this webinar. I'd like to add that um, Connecting to Collections Care, it's a wonderful resource. Um, they have several archived webinars from 2010 um, to present day. And you can learn anything from social media to caring for books 
dealing with digital assets um, to ethical issues in collections management. Upon acquisition, um, whether it be on-site or off-site, all materials donated to the Rare Books and Manuscripts Division becomes the property of the library. The deed of, form, uh, deed of gift form has to be signed and returned to the State Library within 30 days of acceptance, and um, failure to return the deed of gift uh, results in the material being returned to the donor. So our form includes a detailed description of the materials, the donor's contact information, the date of the donation, a description of restrictions, if applicable, uh, any copyright information, and the signature of the donor and the rare books and manuscripts supervisor or any other acting representative. We provide a inventory at the box level uh, and we supply it to the donor within 180 days of the receipt of a deed of gift. The inventory is normally compiled in a Word document and placed within our executive file uh, for future reference and a hard copy is also placed within the first box of the collection. Now, some researchers may be surprised at how strenuous it can be to view materials in a reading room. All reading rooms should have guidelines to help preserve items and protect from possible theft. Does your library have a designated space for patrons to look at special collections or archival material? If not, could a table be provided close to a service desk? It is imperative the items are under close supervision. In this image, you can see our long tables are proportionately spaced and can fit up to two people per table. For security reasons, all of our researchers face the reading room desk. When patrons visit, they can utilize our DaVinci HD desktop magnifier this document camera has the ability to zoom in and out and create contrast to analog material digitally. Um, our reading room is the only one in Indiana to have this equipment, and it was purchased on behalf of the Talking Book and Braille Division within our library. Before this equipment, we heavily relied on magnifiers and loops. A pho photocopy machine is also available upon request and we are always present um, as a staff when special collections or archival material is viewed in this room. Now, after the recent move in our building, we decided to revisit our reading room rules governing the use of materials. And these rules are a set of instructions to our staff and patrons. Um, it's available on our website for patrons to look at prior to their visit. And patrons are required to provide an ID um, with a photograph, so that could be a driver's license, a passport, or a student card, uh, to view material. Staff must verify the person viewing material um, using this photograph identification. And patrons are also required to sign a registration form that includes their name, address, institutional affiliation, and requested materials. The registration form is entered in an administrative um, internal database for future requests, as well as to aid in any criminal investigations. So the, the following rules I'm going to talk about are part of our overall reading room rules governing the use of materials. They are laminated and they're given to each patron viewing special collections or archival material. The first item um, includes rare books, manuscripts, pamphlets, maps, and some pre-1950 printed material should be viewed in the reading room with staff on site. Patrons must fill out a registration form and provide photograph identification in order to use the library material. The signed form uh, for registration constitutes an acknowledgement that the patron will abide by rules and procedures outlined in the form. So as a, a side note, before I move on to um, numbers two through eight, um, a set of internal viewing guidelines were adopted for staff to discern what materials should actually be viewed in our reading room. Um, due to the enormous size of the State Library's collection, 
we understood right away that all items could not be viewed in the reading room. So the following are designations each division head and an administrator had agreed upon. So any pre-1950 printed material is viewed with staff on site in our reading room. And if there is a judgment call to be made, um, we have the following that also require staff. So these are items like first editions, uh, special formats, fine bindings uh, or printings, um, any items of significant value. They might have uh, signs of active mold or a pest infestation, um, and those items are sent to preservation immediately. Uh, if there's any information loss due to water damage, uh, brittleness, or uh, loose bindings, um, maybe they're extremely dirty um, or they're just fragile in, in general. All those items are required to have staff available. So items that do not require staff are um, those with few tears, stains, um, little to no loss of information, the binding is intact, um, and there's very little wear. So if there's a problem there and, and they don't know if items should be sent back to the reading room for our patrons, we let them know just to use good judgment because if they're ever in doubt, they can always page a rare books and manuscripts staff member. So item number two on our rules governing the use of materials, it's about personal property. Um, and this includes coats, briefcases, bags, backpacks. They must be placed in a designated area. Um, only material for research, uh, such as pencils, paper, and laptop computers, are allowed to rest on the tabletops. Um, anything brought into the reading room is, of course, uh, subject to inspection upon leaving because the library is not responsible for stolen items. Of course, there's no eating, drinking, or smoking permitted in the reading room. And um, staff must approve the use of electronic devices and cameras. The use of personal scanners is not permitted in our library. Now, a question um, we often get is, why do we allow cameras? Um, and we actually prefer the use of cameras without a flash um, in comparison to our photocopy machine because light can cause irreversible damage to material. So patrons may not remove material from the reading room. All items must be accounted for before the researcher leaves the reading room. Um, theft or mutilation of material is a crime, which can lead to prosecution. Patrons must keep items in the order in which they are presented to the researcher. They have to keep material flat on the table. They cannot hold items in their hands. They're always uh, suggested to uh, request book props. Um, they should not be laying any objects on top of the material, and photographs and negatives require archival gloves. Um, photocopies and scans cannot be made upon demand. Um, only library staff can make reproductions of materials um, in that sense of scanning, and all requests are subject to staff approval. So if the um, patron anticipates any publishing or exhibiting, um, we have them fill out an application for use of photographic film or image reproduction form, and we also um, prefer the citation as courtesy of the Indiana State Library. I have also included um, the application in the supplemental package to this webinar. Now, I wanted to have a slide dedicated to copyright law because it is a requirement um, that it's included on any photocopier and, and staff desk in our library. And I wanted to make sure that you consider including a similar statement if you have not done so already. So this copyright law is coming straight from um, Title 17 of the United States Code, um, and it governs making photocopies or any reproductions of copyrighted material. And it's, it's basically just covering the library's end um, if the uh, patron decides to use in excess of, of fair use. Um, and it's making sure that the user know, knows that they are liable for copyright infringement and not the library itself. So, so definitely consider having the statement available for the public to see. Um, we've done so, and it's, it's worked really well in our case. 
So we've now reached the um, records lifecycle section of this webinar. And during the next few slides, I'll cover accessioning through disposition. Materials received by a donor or organization undergo a different process than library books, kits, and etc. Donations are usually received as a unit or accession, an accrual or an ingest. Now, when we have accepted a collection and the deed of gift form has been completed, we enter this accession data into our content management system archivist toolkit. Even if you're not using data um, for an electronic content management system, um, the information in an accession record, um, whether it be paper-based or a Word document, um, it, it should be documented electronically um, as well as in a hard copy form within the collection's executive file. So this information um, that you should include is the donation type, meaning is it a collection is it someone's personal papers or records from an organization or business? Title, if you need any help um, with a title um, or the following data I'm going to mention, um, you might consider uh, grabbing a copy of Describing Archives, a content standard, which is also known as DAX. Um, created in 2005, uh, DAX replaced archives, personal papers, and manuscripts. Um, and today, it provides information on the official content standard for describing archival material. So some examples of titles would include Harvey Family Papers, um, a collection of Indiana vacation albums, or in this case, um, Indiana House and Senate seating arrangement charts. And the extent, um, it helps us understand how much cubic or linear feet we have left in our vault. Um, it can also tell us how large a collection is or what type or how many boxes we should use. The container summary, it indicates how many letters, boxes, photographs, etc. are within the donation. The date expression, um, it can be found in the form of a single date or perhaps a date range. Um, some examples would be circa 1920s, uh, maybe it's just 1900. Um, or in this example, 1907 through 1961. Deaccession information, um, you know, do you want to keep everything after the donation was received? Are there multiple copies of items? Um, it's important to let the donor know if there might be disposition before any items are thrown away. Condition. We rate the condition of our materials based on a special collections material survey instrument provided by the Columbia University Library. The Word document is downloadable and it breaks down format types from loose paper, bound items, architectural drawings, graphic works, photographic prints, film, and etc. by condition ratings um, such as terrible, poor, fair, good, excellent, and it's also a wonderful resource um, to guide preservation efforts. And I've included information about that survey um, instrument within the supplemental packet. Donor information. We also create uh, basic donor information within the record to point back to our executive file. Um, a first and last name of the donor or source is included here. Um, we also identify if they are creators or compilers uh, versus being just the source of a donation. Acknowledgements. Um, this section is one of the most important within the accession record. Um, we generally identify the dates that our thank yous are sent, um, when the agreement or the deed of gift was sent, um, when it was received, and whether or not the rights were transferred and on what day. The restriction section and includes restriction information. Um, and at this time, you know, we do not accept materials with restrictions. Um, understand, though, that materials could be restricted by the archivist at a later date, depending on the processing plan. For example, 
Um, an organization might donate their business records and not realize membership documents with social security numbers, um, addresses, phone numbers, etc. Um, are within the treasurer's documents. Now these documents might be returned or disposed of after processing and description has been completed. Um, if not though, um, a decision between the repository and organization to restrict the items might occur. Uh, processing tasks. Um, you know, a good processing plan is a must. If you're interested in developing your own processing plan, I definitely recommend the book How to Manage Processing in Archives and Special Collections by Pam Hackbart-Dean and Elizabeth Slomba. Um, like I said, I highly recommend reading um, chapter two within the book. Um, it's called Processing Priorities, where the authors identify a collection priority worksheet um, that will help you decide processing tasks based on your content, um, physical condition, time to process, and of course staff needed to process. Um, in the grand scheme of things, um, you should definitely consider your backlog. We all have one. And items that have been sitting on the shelf the longest should probably receive at least basic preservation attention first. So finally, after all of this information is recorded, um, we require a thank you be sent to the donor within 30 days of the accepted donation. And we have a basic template that's used and customized per donation. Now, surveying is a broad general overview of the collection. It's the process of gathering basic information about a person's papers or organizational records. It's very important because it can determine future processing and preservation plans. Surveys usually include the amount of material, format types, um, location of items, their physical condition, appropriate storage solutions, and the rate of accumulation over time, if applicable. The survey is normally completed before any processing plans begin. Many repositories do not have a professional conservator on staff, and it's not uncommon for an archivist to take on preservation activities within the library and archive. Now, I won't be discussing the process of preserving archival material during this webinar, but there is a book available by the Society of American Archivists as part of the Archival Fundamentals series titled Preserving Archives and Manuscripts, and it is written by Mary Lynn Reitzenthaler, who is the chief of the Document Conservation Laboratory for the National Archives and Records Administration. I also want to mention, though, um, you can contact me at any time if you'd like to know more information about purchasing basic archival supplies. Um, for specialized conservation information, um, you can also contact Rebecca Schindel, our conservator, at the um, contact information on your screen. Processing is extremely labor-intensive. Um, it can take anywhere from three to ten hours to process one cubic foot or banker's box, uh, depending upon the collection. Um, we give our staff a writing tablet, pencils, erasers, and a workstation equipped with a computer that has an internet connection, um, a pencil sharpener, and of course miscellaneous processing supplies. Staff are then provided adequate time to develop a processing plan based on several criteria, including uh, the physical condition and original order of the collection, um, if there are any obligations to donors um, and or researchers, is there any potential research value, um, record formats, um, and of course their availability to work on the project. Now, it's always best to discuss the potential processing plan to multiple staff. Uh, differing viewpoints is always helpful. You might consider a solution to a problem you didn't even realize existed. Um, for example, uncovering sensitive information within a miscellaneous file or a method to minimize overall processing time. So staff should become familiar with the collection and take notes. 
I often mention to processors that this is your moment to become one with the collection. It's an opportunity to figure out the person, business, or institution inside and out. Staff should spend enough time to develop a preliminary outline for future arrangement, including the uh, potential series and subseries. Um, for beginners, this research and development can take a full day, um, but once you get the hang of things, it could take maybe a morning or an afternoon, depending, of course, on the collection size. Also, it's very important to make note of any preservation issues, including refoldering, boxing, uh, removing fasteners, encapsulating documents or photographs, interleaving scrapbooks, photo albums, and etc. If there are any items you think might need special treatment, this is the time to consider reaching out to a conservator. Now, once again, um, the book How to Manage Processing and Archives in Special Collections by Pam Hackbart Dean and Elizabeth Lamba. It's a wonderful resource to help you and your staff begin any processing projects. Now, arrangement is the process of organizing materials with respect to their provenance and original order. To protect their context and to achieve physical or intellectual control over the materials. Uh, it's the organization or sequence of items within a collection. Uh, typically, there are levels of arrangement, um, including the repository, a collection or record group, a series, a subseries, um, folder, and item. Now, the repository is your institution or your department within the institution. And uh, the collection, those are materials assembled by a person, an organization with some unifying purpose, um, perhaps a senator's political papers or a candy factory's business records. Um, and sometimes collection is interchangeable with the word holdings. A series um, is a group of records based on a file system or maintained as a unit because the records result from the same function or activity. They might have a particular form or maybe they have some other relationship resulting from their creation, um, their accumulation over time, or usage. So in this case, the collection is Matthew E. Welsh's papers. Um, this series is personal documents, political correspondence, his International Joint Commission documents, and post-administration documents. As you go along, you'll see that they are divided into subseries, um, which are documents within a series distinguished from the series by arrangement, type, form, or content. In this case, um, we divided the International Joint Commission documents into his correspondence and manuals and speeches. And then from there, we break it down into the folder or file level. And these are documents related by use or topic housed in a folder or group of folders depending on their size. Um, and I've provided a secondary example with Lucius Ombre's papers um, where you can see the arrow pointing to the folder level um, with his papers to um, a brother from 1860 to 1861. Now, items also exist um, within the archival world. Um, those are distinguished from a group and is complete of in and of itself. Um, it may consist of several pieces, um, but they're generally treated as a whole. For exam example, um, a letter comprising of five pages is one item. And items are generally considered the smallest archival unit, um, but rules on, on items are followed on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, as you can see with my examples of arrangement, archivists generally like a top-down approach um, to arranging and describing materials at the collection, series, and folder level. We usually do not process at the item level. Now, librarians, on the other hand, uh, tend to work with a bottom-up approach. And um, for my time being at the library, I I've seen this many times, and it's been incredibly interesting 
working next to a cataloger and librarian. Um, we've been able, uh, fortunately, to collaborate on projects and learn something new from each other every day. Now, believe me, um, archivists would love to work at the item level. Um, sometimes we do, and it gets us into a little trouble. Um, but if we did, though, um, you know, nothing would ever get done. So with that being said, arrangement and description is a very fluid and organic event. You know, once the collection is arranged and described, it's definitely not permanent. An archivist might revisit the process collection several times throughout its life cycle, especially if there are future additions. Now, almost every archival institution has a backlog, and if you lack adequate resources to properly process, arrange, and describe a collection, it's okay to describe records at the record group or even collection and series level. You have to remember the key to our mission is providing access to information. The collection's value will significantly decrease when items sit in a backlog. So definitely use your common sense and do what you can with what you have. Now, much of what I've mentioned is part of a book that you can purchase. It's called Arranging and Describing Archives and Manuscripts by Kathleen D. Rowe. It's also part of the Archival Fundamentals series by the Society of American Archivists. Um, in the book, she discusses core, concept, core concepts, excuse me, uh, principles and practices of arrangement and description. And much of what I just stated is um, from a section derived from the book. Now, each collection is described in a detailed record called a finding aid, which provides both an overview of the intellectual organization of the collection and a detailed list of items within the collection. So researchers should consult the finding aid for a particular collection in order to ascertain the usefulness of that collection. Now, finding aids are broken up into several sections, including, but not limited to, the header or finding aid information. So that's going to include your collection title, the collection number or archival identifier, the date created, um, repository information, and a table of contents, um, which is not required, but it's generally useful. The next section is archival description, or we call the finding aid core. It includes creators, so you know who created the collection, the extent, or the container summary. In this case, it's cubic feet. Language, um, which is the language of the finding aid itself, but you can also include if materials within the finding aid are in a foreign language, such as German or French. Uh, container information, and this is um, how many boxes or folders are included. Um, and then content, so graphic materials, text, mixed materials, what is actually in those boxes and folders. A preferred citation, biographical, historical, and administrative notes. A scope and content, which includes information about materials such as the record types, date ranges, topics, and the persons represented and arrangement, so the description of basic organization or arrangement of materials. We also make sure to include things like uh, conditions governing access. Um, this is a field to indicate any restrictions on the material due to a repository's policy, um, donor specifications, and etc. Usage, um, you know, are there any restrictions on the use of materials that apply after access has been granted? The custodial history, which is our history of ownership and custody over the materials. Accruals, which is if we expect or do not expect any additions to the materials over time. Processing information, um, this includes things like arrangement, description, preservation acts, actions, um, but we also use this note to include information about who processed the collection and the date it, in which it was processed. And then controlled access headings, um, and this is truly subject headings used for catalog records. 
Now, the meat and potatoes of a finding aid is the collection inventory. And this is where the patron will find the box folder and if there are any item level descriptions. Now, we create our finding aids using Archivist Toolkit, um, which is in the open source archival management system that I had mentioned earlier on. Now, uh, Lyricist has become the organizational home for the next open source archives management system called ArchivesSpace. We are currently looking to transition from Archivist Toolkit to support the management of and access to our archives into ArchivesSpace. Um, there is a cost, though, and you definitely need to find more information at ArchivesSpace's website. Finding aids continue to be added periodically to our online public access catalog, Evergreen, and in our digital collections page via Content DM. Cataloging takes care of the Evergreen record and WorldCat, and Archivist Toolkit generates a wonderful MARC record um, for our catalogers, as well as a PDF copy for our website. You're able to generate an EAD version of the Finding Aid 2, and EAD is Encoded Archival Description, which is an XML standard for encoding finding aids. Um, you know, usually archival students are required to take an EAD class um, before receiving an Archives and Records Management specialization. Um, so if you want to learn more information about EAD, definitely visit the Library of Congress. And I've added that link within the um, supplemental packlet, packet. Now the finding aids are also available on the library's website in alphabetical order, but you might also decide to break the finding aids into categories by subject. Um, for example, Civil War collections might be lumped together um, similar to a Pathfinder. Now, our finding aids are full text searchable using a Google Advanced Search. Um, patrons are able to type in items such as Oliver P. Morton or Women's Suffrage, and Google filters which collections are relevant based on their notes, subject headings, and inventory. Now we found there's normally a two-week gap between us uploading the PDF finding aids and Google actually indexing them. As a side note, um, you know, we've also worked with the library's um, development office on integrating our finding aids into CERCs. Um, and CIRCS is Indiana's statewide remote circulation service. It's the latest and largest res resource um, sharing tool in the state. The system is currently linking over 150 Indiana libraries into a single interface. Um, there are 65 academic libraries, um, about 159 public libraries, and two special collections included within the system. If you'd like to know more information about CIRCS, um, you can visit the library's website. So there are many more ways um, to provide online access to your finding aids, and please feel free to reach out to me um, directly for more information. Now, I'm not going to um, spend too much time on the how-tos of digitizing archival material. Um, the Library Development Office has provided services on a regular basis. Um, for more information, you should reach out to Connie Renfield, um, which is our digitization expert. Um, she'll be able to direct you um, to Indiana Memory, which is a collaborative um, between Indiana libraries, museums, and archives using a, a digital library. And it's really enabled access to um, several um, historical heritage items um, through a variety of digital formats. Um, and you can learn more information about Indiana Memory on our website. Uh, before the end of the year, um, the State Library's Public Services um, section um, digitization staff will be providing a webinar on digitization efforts. Um, you can view our public services digital collections on our website. I've also taken a screenshot of it for this slide. Our digital collections are part of Indiana Memory, housed in Content DM. Items from the collection that are digitized um, receive a link back to their finding aid if it's applicable. 
We link the catalog record to the digital content in Evergreen as well. Um, it's our hope, really, that patrons will be able to seamlessly receive access to the finding aid, the catalog record, and the digital content in only a few clicks. Now, before, during, or after processing, you, um, your staff, you might decide you'd like to remove material from your repository. Um, depending on your policy, the items could be returned to the donor, offered up to another institution, um, or even destroyed. Now, it's important to document the decision and retain the information in the collection's executive file. Rare books and manuscripts must provide a justification as to why the collection should be deaccessioned. Um, any pre-existing conditions identified within the deed of gift or other documentation giving ownership to the library has to be verified. Right now, our deaccession options include transferring as a gift to a public or nonprofit in-state institution, um, a transfer of a gift um, to a public or nonprofit out-of-state institution, um, and sale from the best offer received from a public posting upon um, a listserv or um, et cetera. Of course, our priority is to transfer to an in-state institution. You know, every effort, though, should be made to contact the individual who donated the collection. If the individual is not living and the item was obtained within the last 10 years, the library shall make a good faith effort to notify the heirs of the descendant. If the heirs cannot be identified or located, the library gives notice by publication in the newspaper having the greatest circulation in the county where the individual last resided. Um, and if we don't know that information, then we um, send it to Marion County, which is the Indy Star, um, because that's the greatest circulation uh, within the state. So if we don't hear anything back from the heirs, um, their assignees, or any other institutions, um, these items are disposed of by the established means within the guidelines of the state government center complex. So there's some questions that you should definitely keep in mind. You know, do we not want to keep everything after the donation was received? You know, have you found some unwanted, unaffiliated items within the collection? Don't feel like you have to keep everything. Um, we received a family's personal papers with a set of magazines available at another institution that were already digitized. You know, unless you have copies um, or of handwritten notes um, or more fully um, explain the person's livelihood, it's more than acceptable to deaccession the items altogether. You know, at the end of the day, you have to remember that space is not free. Also, you know, do the item or items possibly deaccession add any significant research or monetary value to the collection? It's a really important question. Are there multiple copies of items? You know, three copies is usually enough. Um, your institution should probably have a policy to guide staff on this issue. In rare books and manuscripts, um, you know, we have a, a company's letterhead, labels, pencils, and promotional items. Instead of keeping packages of 100 plus of each, we narrow it down to a more manageable few. Does another institution want these items? You know, sometimes it's best to see if the institution wants the collection, especially if they don't fit within your development policy. Um, if the collection development policy has been revised since the donation, Reach out to the donor and let them know of your planned course. Now, like I said, these are all important questions to ask before um, deaccessioning and completing any data entry. Once the decision is made, though, um, make sure to record the following information. The date of deaccession, the detailed description of items, the disposed of or transferred information. We have a separate location for deaccessioned ex executive files behind um, our supervisor's desk. If a patron would like more information about the collection or decision made, the file loca is located in a convenient area for internal viewing. These files will act as your due diligence folder, so it's really important to keep track of how you came to your decision 
you really never know when you might need the paper trail, um, as well as an electronic deaccession record to make your case. Now, I hope this webinar was informative. Um, most importantly, though, I, I hope it shed light on the differences between archives and libraries. With that being said, despite our differences, we are very similar in that we are public servants, public servants um, striving for the best for our patrons. You know, never forget that we can do better by working together. Now, included with this webinar is a bibliography of the books, websites, and links to the statements mentioned throughout the presentation. I've also included other reads you might find interesting as you learn more about the archival profession. Many of these books can be found within the uh, Society of American Archivists bookstore on their website, Amazon, or even at the State Library. Also included will be a deed of gift form, a registration form, the rules governing the use of our reading room, and the application for use of photographic film or image reproduction form. Make sure to take a look at our website for more information here. Um, so it's http slash slash www.in.gov slash library slash manuscripts. Um, you know, not only will you see images from the collection, you can view our finding aid index, our subject guides, our service fees, our forms, any contact information. Um, if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact me at 317-234-8621 or at bfeekter at library.in.gov. Thank you for spending time with me today.